if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Philippians 4, 4 through 7. It is, for some of us, a fairly familiar passage of Scripture. As you are turning, I give God thanks and praise for my family, who I think is tuning in because my baby girl already um, texted me that she saw Nyla on the stage. So much love to my beloveds who are home. The passage reads as follows, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all people for the Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. I want my peace. I want my peace. Let's bow for a word of prayer as we center ourselves. Almighty God, who you are is often beyond our ability to comprehend, but God, yet you make yourself accessible. And so we pray now in Jesus' name that you grant to us the ability to be fully present in this moment, that we may be sensitive to the sound of your voice, that you may speak in this space to each of us in our hearts and in our minds in the way that we need to receive and then speak to us collectively as your body. God, that we may move and live and operate in this world as you intend. Grant to us, almighty God, this gift, and we will be ever so careful to give your name the praise. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So even if you are not a Star Wars fan, I am, I would imagine that most of you have at least heard about the Jedi, okay? So the Jedi are um, this, it's this ancient order of protectors in Star Wars that are bound together by their ability or capacity to access this power called the Force. Now, they are also bound together by certain understandings, which is they um, lead a life of inward meditation, seeking to seek inner tranquility, right? And they try to avoid emotions like anger and hatred. Well, at this particular point in the Star Wars galaxy, the Federation, right, which is now the side of the Jedi, and the Resistance, not to be confused with uh, the Rebellion that comes later, are at war, okay? They are at war. And as this war progresses, the Jedi who have taken this vow not to be aggressive in any way unless they are attacked or someone else is attacked, they are now at the front line of this war. And one particular Jedi reaches a point in the narrative where he struggles because he sees himself as a keeper of the peace. But he has found himself in a position where he, he is the general of an army. But what he may not know as a character in that story that some of us know because we know the whole story that on both sides, both on the Federation and the resistance side, there is corruption. Which means that whatever peace he thinks he's keeping is an illusion. It does not exist. We cannot keep what does not exist. And so what he finds is that he must then lean in not to peacekeeping, but peacemaking. That if peace is to be had, we got to make it. And so he has to lean into the discomfort, the risk of this peacemaking business. You see, if we lean only towards peacekeeping where there is no peace, y'all, it only serves to give power and to enable the forces that oppress, that harm, not only us externally as a society, but also internally within ourselves. Now, we've shout out to our colleagues who are here with Live Free and Pastor Mike and others among us who may be moving in organizing circles. There's a very real distinction made between peacekeeping 
and peacemaking. That the work of redemption and justice in this world must rely on the making of peace. Now, as I was looking at this passage, though, I wondered, because as I see and move in the world, I encounter people both on like a personal level and on a collective level, really leaning more into peacekeeping. And so that made me ask the question, do we really know what peace is? Perhaps not. Well, I believe that this passage may have some things in it that will allow us to clarify some misconceptions about peace. Because I don't know about you, but I think most of us want peace. Most of us need peace. And I believe all of us deserve peace. So the first misconception I think we see in this passage about peace is that peace is not about positivity. Peace is not about positivity. Rejoice in the Lord, what? Always. Again, I say, rejoice. Now, y'all, I need to give a caveat. Y'all know I give a lot of caveats in my sermons. I generally like to stay away from absolute language, right? And that's because I don't believe any of us are consistent enough to do something so often that we can move in the absolute. However, when absolute language shows up in a sacred text, I believe it demands of us the honor and the respect that it is written in. This word, rejoice in the Lord always, not sometimes, not when I feel like it, but all the time. And then, as if we did not hear it, again I say, rejoice. Now, the problem I have, though, is what about when I don't feel like rejoicing? Right? What happens when I don't feel like rejoicing? What do I do with a verse like this? And there's been a lot of buzz lately about something that I have found to be quite real called toxic positivity, right? Yep, y'all know. Somebody know. Amen. <laughs> this concept of favoring or dismissing any emotions that we experience as negative in, um, in order to replace them with this idea, this thought that we must remain positive all the time at all costs. It's a very harmful concept, right? That doesn't allow for the movement of emotions and free, free emotions of what we feel, right? So if I'm reading this though as um, be positive, and joyful in the Lord at all times, then this means that this passage might be asking me to engage in toxic positivity. And since I can't bring myself to believe that God would ever ask me to move in a way where I am dishonest about who I am and how I feel, then I said to myself, well, there got to be something else. So I said, you know what? I need to look at what these words mean, <laughs> right? And so when I went and I started digging and I found that the word here, rejoice, is kahiro. Okay, it is a word meaning to lean toward or to delight, take pleasure in God's grace. To lean toward or to delight, take pleasure in God's grace. What does that mean? It means that now we have two pathways for rejoicing. That if I am in a hard place and I am struggling and I don't feel like jumping up and down, that I don't have to delight in God's grace. I can simply lean towards it, which means that even if I'm feeling real jacked up, all God is saying is just don't shut me out. Lean, right? But if I am in a good place, this passage says that I am to take pleasure. Now y'all, we don't talk a lot about God and pleasure. We don't like to put them two things together. I promise you, I did not write this. It's in the Bible. Right? God and pleasure. When I moved here from North Carolina um, to California, one of the things I loved about the Bay was its food, right? But there were some restaurants back home, there are some restaurants back home that were not here, that are not here. And one of those restaurants is called Bojangles. It's a chicken and biscuit place for those who don't know. 
Okay, you ever come to the South, stop it, Bojangles. Better than Popeyes, I promise. And so Dedrick and I, my husband and I, we would crave Bojangles so bad, y'all, that I started looking up copycat recipes, trying to make Bojangles chicken and biscuits, right? It didn't work. After one year of being here, the first time we flew home, I lied to you not. Before I got to my mama's house, I said, we have got to stop at Bojangles. <laughs> we didn't even make it to my mama's house. We like, no, we about to get some Bojangles right now. And I promise you all, the first bite and the last bite, <laughs> they were the best. Like, my body responded to the pleasure of it. I closed my eyes, I began to moan. Mm -hmm. I began to grieve when I took the last bite because I ain't had no more. My body reacted to what I now know is called um, dopamine, a uh, uh, pleasure sensor. So pleasure has its own natural reward system. Right? It releases hormones. Re hormones are released in your brain that are known to what? Regulate emotions, right? Stimulate memory and movement, right? So what does this mean for us? It means you all, if we are able to delight, to take pleasure in God's grace, it has the capacity to regulate our emotions. It has the capacity to clarify our memory. It has the capacity to help us move. Y'all, we don't talk enough about pleasure. And you know, I think we should talk more about it in an appropriate way because not talking about pleasure only leaves, sp leaves space for the suppression of certain things and the misuse of how we access it. You all, peace is not about positivity. Peace is about the grace of God and leaning in and or receiving the grace of God no matter where or how I may be feeling. The second thing or misconception I think we must clarify about peace that shows up in this passage, I need y'all to stay with me on this one. Peace is not about kindness. Don't let nobody go out here and say, Pastor Donna said we can't be kind. No, I need you to be kind. I want you to be kind, right? Now, kindness may be a byproduct of peace, but kindness in and of itself is not peace, okay? My daddy, who died in um, 2012, taught my sister and I many things in both words and deed. But one of the memories that I have of what he taught us was when we got into high school and got to dating age, he would tell us that anytime we started dating someone new, that we could not accept a gift from them unless we had permission from him and my mom. And he explained to us why. He says, now, you know, if it's Christmas and birthdays, okay, that's fine, right? Those are just regular kind of times when you exchange gifts. He says, but I need you to be very careful about anyone who seeks to buy your loyalty before they are willing to put in the time that is, that is due for commitment. He says there are transactional dynamics at play in relationships that can create a power imbalance that harms. And until you can figure that out, we decide that for you. Right? We decide that for you. What does the passage say? Let your gentleness be known to everyone. Another absolute word. Everyone. Without exception. Right? And we often read this passage as let your kindness be extended to everybody. <laughs> That's not what this passage is saying. And you all, because of the things that my dad and my mom taught us, I was a bit intrigued when all of these campaigns started coming out around Be Kind, right? I started riding around town and I saw Be Kind bumper stickers and I saw like Be Kind things in the window and everything. And I get it, don't get me wrong. I know we have had political leaders who have moved the barometer on what it means to, to interact with each other in a respectful way. So I get that. Now, but my intrigue, moved to frustration and even anger. When I began to sit in rooms in my city with leaders who had political power, who were crafting whole campaigns 
around kindness, all while denying the people who were on the ground fighting for like affordable housing and fighting for a, minimum, uh, a, a livable wage, right? So they were crafting their whole thing around kindness and it felt a lot like gaslighting. It felt a lot like the established folks saying, hey, let's just go back to how it used to be where we were pretending that all this stuff won't hear so that I can feel better, right? Kindness in response to injustice alone is a power play. When we only respond to acts of violence and injustice by saying we just need to all be more kind, it is a way of saying the people who are not impacted by injustice just want to be comfortable again. Nobody whose baby is lying dead on the street or on the floor of a school wants to hear you say, oh, we just need to be more kind to each other. You know why? Because you can be kind to me and still consciously or unconsciously deny my humanity. Now the Sufi teacher, Idris Shah, he said this. He says, if you exercise power by kindness, you can do more damage than by exercising kindness by, I mean, power by cruelty, right? That, that both are wrong and incorrect, right? And so the question here becomes then, then what is this passage saying? Well, I looked up the word, right? And the word here, gentleness, is not kindness. The word here that is in the Greek is actually epiaikis. And what does epiaikis mean? Epiaikis means um, equitable justice or just beyond ordinary justice. All right? I want y'all to hear me here. Let your justice be known to everyone without exception, the Lord is near. Now there are a couple of reasons why this is difficult for us. One is, if we are gonna let our justice, our equitable justice, which is uh, uh, not just regular justice, right? Equitable justice is when we give an account or we are fair in a way that gives an account for the ways in which some people over time have been subjected to unfairness for long periods of time, right? Which creates then high levels of privilege and advantage for others and very low disadvantage for others, right? And if we're gonna let all of everyone know, it means one, in order to be equitable in our justice that we have to be proximate to injustice. And being proximate to injustice, y'all, means being proximate to pain. It's hard. It's difficult. It means also being able to see the ways in which we have been socialized in society that sometimes we contribute to the pain of other people. It means being proximate to our own pain if we are going to get justice even internally. But it's also difficult because it says we need to be let it known to everyone. That means we don't get to pick and choose. When we say, no, God has called us by faith and by, as the church to commit our lives to equitable justice. That this is literally a part of our identity. We don't get to pick and choose who's sitting in the room when we decide we're going to claim this, when we're going to own it, right? And you all, we don't, we don't do this, we don't proclaim this so that we can be right, or so that we can proclaim that we are better than other people. No, we do this, why? Because the Lord is near. That means that redemption and salvation is at risk the most for those who oppress. And if we don't say anything, who will ever be concerned about their souls? You see, justice is for those who are harmed and for those who harm, right? And justice does not mean the absence of consequence. We're not gonna go down that road, but I just wanted to name that. So what does this passage tell us? It tells us there can be no peace without justice. No justice. Peace is not about kindness. Peace is about justice. I didn't write it. It's in that thing we call the Bible, amen? The third misconception. 
I think that shows up in this passage about peace that we need to clarify is that peace is not about unwavering faith. When folks among us doubt, some people see doubt and wavering faith as a weakness. And I think that's a very dangerous notion, right? As, in fact, as a matter of fact, some folks will say, some uh, mystics would even say that, I don't even know if your faith is real if you never doubt it, right? Like, how can you ever know if it's never been tested in that way? But really, when we th think about worry, which is what this next verse says, right? Do not be worried about anything, but in everything. Those are two absolute words, right? Take your prayers and supplications and thanksgiving to the Lord right? That really the presence of worry and anxiety is more so a sign of people who wish to live in a safe way in a world that feels very dangerous, right? But this is not about unwavering faith. Now, there are three gospels that are called the synoptic gospels, right? That is Matthew, Mark, and Luke. What does that mean? The synoptic gospels simply mean that these three gospel books often tell the same accounts just from different perspectives, Okay, And in those three synoptic gospel books, there is a story or an account that we all are pretty familiar with, right? Where Jesus and his disciples get ready to cross the Sea of Galilee, and they go between two mountain ridges and a storm rises up, right? And Jesus is straight up chilling, sleep, right, on this boat. The disciples we should never miss, who are experienced sailors and fisher people, right, are scared. That's how bad this storm is. They are experienced and they are scared, okay? And what do they do? They go and they wake Jesus up and they be like, dude, you need to do something about this, <laughs> right? And so Jesus wakes up and Jesus says, you of little faith, right? And he what? He rebukes the wind and the waves. Now, that is Matthew and Luke's version. Now, Mark's version, he gets up and he actually says, peace be still to the waves. But he also says in Mark's version, um, why you of no faith? Now, the reason I think it's always good with the synoptic gospels to compare and to blend these narratives and these accounts is for this reason. Because in Mark's account, he says no faith, but in the other two accounts, he says little faith, and there is actually evidence of faith right? They actually go to the one person on the boat who can help them, right? And here's what we need to hear you all. Little does not automatically mean weak. Now, most recipes that I bake with require a little bit of salt. It don't take a lot, but you leave that salt out, don't nobody want to eat with us. Right? Little does not always mean weak. Faith the side of what a itty bitty little mustard seed can move mountains. They took their shaking, wavering faith to the one person on the boat who could save them and guess what happened? They were saved. You all, peace is not about unwavering faith. So then when we look at this word worry in this particular verse, it comes from a word mirham naho, which means to divide, to pull apart, right? What does that mean? It means that I am no longer whole. It means that my mind and my emotions are being pulled in different directions. I'm trying to be present, but I can't stop having my mind on something else, right? It is a disintegration of mind and spirit. Right? Can you see that? That's what worry means. It's a disintegration. But that is the antithesis of peace. How do we know that, Donna? Because the next verse says, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. Peace in this verse is not shalom as we are often familiar with. It is a word, irene. And what does irene mean? Irene means whole. So where worry means to disintegrate, whole or peace means to put back together. 
It means to be fully whole. Now, it is no secret that I'm a sci-fi fan, and I'm working through this sci-fi uh, book series now where there's a character in the book who has the capacity to separate his consciousness from his body. Right? But the thing is, he can't stay disintegrated too long because it runs the risk of taking his life. Right? It's this idea that his consciousness cannot fully live in reality without his body, and his body can't survive for long without his consciousness. And so if he stays too long, his body begins to atrophy, it begins to die. But the moment he comes back, though he is weak, he is fully integrated again. He comes what? Back to life. You all guard. The word guard here is translated from a word that is a military term meaning defense. I want you to hear this. I want you to hear this. Peace, which means to be whole, guards our hearts and our minds. It is a protector for the ways in which we move in this world that would seek to what? Disintegrate us in mind, body, and spirit. How beautiful it would be though, y'all, if we could just say, don't worry. If we could just not worry. All of us know that ain't true. So it looks like we need one other thing. We need one other thing to help us with this worrying, right? With this disintegration of ourselves. And I believe that's hope. I believe hope shows up in this passage. And hope is the thing can get, that can get us over that hump. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, right, shall guard your hearts, your minds, in Christ Jesus. If something is beyond our understanding, that means that there is nothing we can do to conjure it up. That means it is far beyond our grasp on our own, right? That means that if God can uh, think or know things, see things that we can't, that also means that God knows things and can do things that we can't conceive of, right? What if our hope, right? I've said it before, I think it's worthy of saying again. What if our hope, in cases like these, are, is dependent upon what we don't know. That when we have done every single thing we can, we've tried every single prayer, we've exhausted every single resource, and we still can't see a way out, that that is where our hope kicks in. Why? Because God can see a thing. And God can do a thing that is far beyond our ability to even conceive it. We don't even know what it is. That means that our hope rests soundly in the mystery of God. That means when everybody else is up against the wall and there are no other options and they are giving up, we say, no, this is where our capacity stops and God's begins. Heard this sister give a testimony once. And in her testimony, she says, you know, I was living paycheck to paycheck and still barely making ends meet. She says, one of those things where you just pray and nothing goes wrong because you know you can't, you don't have the capacity in your budget to hold anything else. She says, and sure enough, my car went out and she was living in a town in a city with no public transportation. She says, and so what did I do? She said, I called my people to see if I could borrow some money, but they was just as strapped as I was. She says, I tried to barter with the mechanic. Can I get on a payment plan? And they said no. She says, and I, I tried this, and I tried that, and I tried to rework my budget, and can I pull from this budget in order to, to pay here? She says, nothing works. She says, and finally, I broke down in tears, and she says, I said, okay, God, okay. I can't see a way out of this. She says, but if there is a way, I need you to do what you do. So the next morning she got up and she went to her mailbox and there was a check in her mailbox for almost the exact amount that she needed to fix her car from the car insurance company because she, they had overcharged her, right? Something she never could have conceived of, never thought was possible. Now y'all, every single adult in this room 
has at least one experience where you had a need and you didn't know how it was going to work out and somehow it happened. What is that saying to us? It's saying that our lived experience is proof. It is proof that our hope is secure in the mystery and in the power of God. This is why faith is what? The substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things what? Unseen. Hope is not seeing the way out. It's always believing there is a way out. And as long as God knows what we don't know, sees what we can't see and can do what we can't do, then our hope and our peace is secure. Now, I don't know about you, but I want my peace. I need my peace and I deserve my peace. So what does that mean? It means we got to be about the work of peacemaking. In the name of the one who is good and just, the healer, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you.